there are three hills in Morbishim, and the views from any angle are just marvelous. The ridges uh, in this part of Huronia, the Vesey Ridge and the Rosemount Ridge, are spectacular pieces of scenery. They hedge in the five small rivers of Huronia, which never stop running. They all have their own valley, the Hog Valley, the Y Valley, the Sturgeon Valley, the Coldwater Valley, and they are hemmed in by the most beautiful ridges, densely wooded. And if you drive the concession roads, it, it is to almost go crazy. back 52 years ago and uh, we lived in what was called Duck Bay across from Wabashi and uh, what I remember is rowing across the lake and landing at what we call the slip. As we landed in, uh, at the slip came up the house to uh, the left as the house my dad was born in 98 years ago. My name is Bob Smith. I was born in Dover, England, 1894. We come out here to Canada when I was 14. My dad was out here. He'd come out in a cattle boat. We were miners children. My father was a coal miner in Yorkshire, Leeds, Yorkshire, England. And from one strike to the other, we never seemed to get ahead. We were always very poor. My, fa my mother died, and my father decided he was going to emigrate to Canada. So. Uh, we came on a government plan in 1929. Caroline Miller, Shudley Knighton in Devonshire, England. March the 17th, 1892. I came to Canada in 1914. Isabel, Elena, Alonso, Bilbao in the north of Spain. Well, I was born in 1909, so that would be just before the beginning of the First World War. I grew up in England. I was in and middle uh, high school about the year 1913, 14. This was the early 1900s. Uh, my father was, uh, my father was in. I think was in the Boer War. Now I just forget. I think it would be about 1903. I went to Judge Ketchum School in Toronto. Uh, we used to come up by train after school. And Everybody come out at 10 o'clock at night and meet the train. Everybody went down to the station meet the train. So you gathered at the station to see who's coming off it, and people, naturally, uh, a lot of their stuff would come off, and boats and things like that that people would send up, and that was the only way they'd come up, was by train. We used to leave 
down to the station about 7.30 in the morning, and we'd get in here shortly after one. But it used to be a long train, and it would be packed. You were lucky if you um, got a seat. A few years ago, uh, she, was she the queen then? Yeah, she had just been crowned, I guess. But she came here to Canada on a visit, and uh, she didn't come through going up, but coming back, she was to come down through little old Wabashim, which we were... We all hurried down to the railroad crossing where the uh, Legion is, and we uh, got a beautiful view of her because the train went slowly through, and she stood on the back. Now we had to wait till the last carriage came, and then sort of crowd in around it and look at her going, because it didn't stop. But it was quite exciting. The pioneers, when they came here in the 19th century, brought up with their plows as many as 2,000 axe heads on one field and thought they were the first people here. Had no idea where these axe heads had come from. They, re they don't realize that one of the great battles that men ever fought was fought on those fields right at the Hog River. They figured there was 1,500 Iroquois in the war party that came up here to finish off Huronia and there were 80 warriors at St. Louis. And they were under the command of the greatest war chief that the Hurons ever had. Stephen Analta, he was a Christian, he was baptized. And they repulsed the Iroquois three times. And when the battle was over, they were practically all dead except Stephen. And he was taken prisoner and he was taken to St. Ignace and he witnessed the torture and martyrdom of two priests. When old Mickey was here, he had cow. You know where uh, Peter Pan is? Where Peter Pan's lot is? Yeah. With his cow, yeah. And he asked where he milked his cow the night. And Mickey always carried a shovel when he went for his cows to get his cows in the evening to milk them, you know. And he always carried a shovel. I'd say to Mickey, what do you carry the shovel for, Mickey? He said, well, I'll tell you, Bob, he said, there's three hills in Wabashine here. One, two, three. I said, yes, there is. I said, I go up there fishing and I can see them, quite plain. One, two, three hills. He said, you know, when the Jesuits were here and the Indians raided the Jesuits, he said, they buried the chalices. He said, and they buried them in a, a, a big iron trunk. Now he said, they're buried on three hills, Bob, he said, and I dig every time I go to find my cows down the bush. I dig here and I dig there. That's the reason why I carry the shovel. I'm gonna find those chalices one day. They're all gold, you know, they come from France. But he never ever found them. <laughs> when we lived on Granny White Side Road, we found out where to go and dig for uh, Indian relics, like uh, broken pottery, arrowheads, uh, skin and knives, an odd tomahawk, and um, pipes, broken pieces of pipe. To my knowledge, I, I never seen a, um, a complete pot. They're all in fragments. When I was a little girl going to the public school here, um, there were, of course, no bridges at that time, and we had to come over to school in the boat, and uh, then in the winter time, we uh, crossed over on the ice. The first day we went back to school after the ice formed, like the night before, Dad would say, well, I think you can go to school in the morning and testing the ice. And uh, he would start off, and we would follow along behind, and he had a large sleigh, and he'd take his axe, and on the sleigh he had, oh, a lot of little cedar trees, maybe maybe even 24. And he would um, chop a hole in the ice and stick one of the little trees down. Of course, it would freeze solid in a few minutes go along the same distance and put another one in in the same distance until we got right across. And that was so that we would never get lost up the bay because often it would be a blizzard after school and we could always see the next tree and we'd go to the next one, the next one, until we saw our home. Now, we often had trouble with our, with our horses. Now, they'd get out sometimes. I would let them out to go down to water and they've gone in there. And what my dad would do, he'd get a rope and he'd go down and he'd last sue them yeah. And, and then uh, sort of choke them so they'd, uh, they'd just uh, sort of float and he'd, on their side and he'd haul them onto the ice again.
it was uh, altogether different because there was no roads hardly. Just grab a road from Toronto up here. Uh, there was hardly any paved roads. Uh, but the people, you know, the people were different, and uh, there was a lot of French spoken in those days here. You see, all the older people talk French. The mass was said in French. The father, the priest that was here was Father Bouvray, and he said mass in French. We came all around the ice, walked over to Sunday school, the church in the morning, the Sunday school in the afternoon. I remember one time my dad wore his hip rubber boots over to church, and my mother thought that he should have brought another pair of shoes and changed. But as it happened, the man who took up the collection wasn't there, and my dad had to take up the collection, and mother was just so mortified. My dad thought that was the biggest joke. You see, th this house we're in now is uh, over 100 years old, and this, these houses were built by the mill. The mill owned the houses. We owned the general store. The man that run the general store worked for the Georgia Bay Lumber Company. The man that uh, that was a paymaster worked for the Georgia Bay Lumber. Everybody worked for the Georgia Bay Lumber Company, and and they bought all their things at the Georgia Bay Lumber Company general store. You know how the general store worked in the olden days: the boots and the food and the everything, clothes. You know, we do such a thing as insulation in those days. Yeah. And after some of the people bought the home from the Georgian Bay Company, they would get loads of this sawdust and fill it between the joists. I see. Yeah. And if a house burnt in a machine, it would burn, it would, the fire would last for about three or four days after. <laughs> My dad had given up farming, and uh, he decided to move us into Wabashin, and he went to work in the mill then. He set up on the carriage, he was a filer, he was uh, uh, anything that would, uh, any, any jobs at all. Uh, in uh, summer holidays, at an early age, I would say I would be 12 or 13, I, I got 50 cents a day, and we had to work from 6 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock at night. I was married in 1915, and uh, my husband went overseas two days after I was married. And in 1916, another bride and I, we went over to England. And I came back here in November 1916, and then my uh, baby was born in January 1917. My husband was killed in October. What prior to the baby's birth, the Battle of the Somme. It was a Saskatchewan regiment mm -hmm. and was just in France three weeks altogether when yeah. he was killed. When war broke out in 1914, my cousin Ernest Clark was uh, one of the first to, to get killed by a sniper. down here, Stan Morton, and we had a dance hall, the pool hall, which is uh, down here in the corner. The name of it was the Golden Slipper. So we had two dance halls here. But down here, the, this Stan Morton dance hall, you could uh, have a room and, uh, and board there. And down the street a little further was a hotel. The man run that, his name was Tracy Holland. He had a hotel there. There was a dance hall there, open, open air one, right for the railroad track. And we had a lovely dance hall here when I was teaching. The, if you heard about the Bayview down here, it was lovely, Stan Warden's Bayview. And uh, it was a nice place to dance. It was nicely conducted. We all wore our nice long summer dresses, and the boys all dressed nicely, and, and we had a good time. And uh, it was nice. They had colored lights along there, and it was really nice. I was crazy about dancing, I used to go dancing. And there was a border all around the dance floor where onlookers could go and sit and enjoy the dancing even though they didn't dance at all. And they had a, an orchestra. They used to board. 
board at the Wabashini in the hallways. And uh, they always used to dress, dress in their blazers and their white pants, you know. But it was uh, well patronized. Another character was Roy Platt. He's still living here. Roy, he's a car. He was a character that ever was one. He has a restaurant down here. Uh, one night, uh, there was a big American woman come in, and she had diamond rings wrapped to her elbows. And she had a big Cadillac car, and she drove right to the door, and it was after dark. She says, I want three dozen frogs. We sold frogs. I had them out, outside in a cage, you know. So I said, well, I'll get you, I'll get you your frogs. I said, would you like some coffee? And she said, yes, give me a cup of black coffee. She put three sheets in the wind anyway. I poured her out this cup of scalded coffee. I went in the back and I fished around, fell around until I got these frogs and I put them in one of them hat pots. I put them on there and there were three or four people in the restaurant at the time. And one of these big frogs hit the lid. So the whole, the whole dozen was out on a... They were sitting on Sandra, just they were, <laughs> they were all over the place. And one of them lived right in the center of her cup of coffee, right dead in the center of it. And it turned as white as a sheet. And his legs were draped over one, you know, one end, and his head over the other. He was the funniest looking creature I ever seen, and stiff as a board. <laughs> so I said, the woman, I said, you like another cup of coffee? <laughs> Then, of course, the Depression came pretty bad. And we lost the home for the sake of $45, which we couldn't, couldn't raise. And no one would loan you money in those days because there was no security to give them, you see. We lost everything. The company houses, you know. Yes. They owned a great many of the houses here, you knew that. Yeah. And uh, when the mill closed, they were sold off very, very reasonably. And um, a lot of some of them were torn down. There must have been close to a hundred men that were working in the sawmill. And uh, a lot of buildings were pulled down and lots of them were sold just for a song. Get rid of them. Tifos had a big shock, time of the depression. And they sold bread. They didn't have a store, you know. They had a big shock. And they, uh, they traveled quite a distance, right down to King, near, near Toronto, to sell bread. Uh, the bus driver was one of the drivers. That's Eddie Morrow was one of the drivers for TIFO in those days. And I think the loaves were about five cents a loaf those days. The only industry, really, that was here when we came was boat building. And that was the Broder Brothers. They used to build some beautiful boats down on the waterfront. But when the uh, tourist business started, uh, why, you see, there was always tourist business here, but the, the, the tourist business was on the islands. Yes. But then later on, that they came, it came into the town. You see, it's, it's tourist town now. Uh, years ago, uh, there was a big camp came up here called the Buckeye Camp from Columbus, Ohio. And uh, I used to guide for them for a dollar a day. And there was always a prize for the largest fish. I remember that uh, big cat of muskie that weighed uh, 13 pounds. Somebody got a channel cat that weighed 14. And uh, on account of a must have been so much better than the channel cat. I rode the boat to Abishin and got a bunch of railroad spikes and put in his mouth. <laughs> he, he weighed uh, 14 and a half pounds. <laughs> and uh, we got the prize that time. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard the fellows talk that were in the services in the war, that no matter where in the world they were, India or Japan or Australia or any place, it's for group of men were talking and anybody ever mentioned Wabashine, there was always at least one that had heard about or knew something about Wabashine. 
Mm -hmm. I think that's interesting. A little yeah. place like this. And things. I love all those islands out there. I used to go over them all, and I traveled on them. I've been out all night on them, and that's what I love about them. Fresh, clean water, air, beautiful air. It's got character and charm, and the most gorgeous trees. It's the prettiest village in Ontario. I wouldn't want to leave Wabashin ever, and I'm glad I came, and I wish I'd found it sooner. And I find the people just wonderful. I would like to like it to stay as it is. Exactly. We travel quite a bit in the summertime. England, Scotland, France, Caribbean, and we're at a lot of places. And um, when we get back, why, this was the nicest place, and now I won't leave it in the summer.